name is Ricky Burdett and I'm an, uh, an urbanist, someone interested in cities. I'm from the London School of Economics and I'm in Cape Town to launch my new book called Living in the Endless City. So Living in the Endless City is a, a large book, 500 pages, which represents a really intense project which has gone on for a number of years. Uh, and it looks as nine cities around the world, but three in detail. Istanbul, Mumbai and Sao Paulo. But it really is um, a way of getting a sense of what's happening to urbanization around the world. It's called endless city, the whole notion, because now cities are more than 50% of the world's population live in cities. Um, but also they're becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. You, know, you never know where they end. That's why it's called endless city. So it's a project about understanding what's happening, the internal dynamics, uh, and the relationship between the shape of the city, how big it is, how small it is, its transport infrastructure, the relationship between that and the people who live in it. Well, when my great-grandfather was alive, not that long ago, uh, the urban population of the world was 10%. Three years ago, it became 50%. In 25 years from now, it will be 75%. So we are, are just past the tipping point in terms of more people living in cities rather than living in the countryside. Then there are two major urgencies that need to be addressed. Cities consume 75% of world energy and contribute 75% of CO2 emissions. So if we continue growing and continue consuming and polluting, cities are going to make the world worse. On the other hand, actually, if you design cities better, if you make them more efficient, more sustainable, uh, more compact, less dependent on the private car, less polluting, you can actually change the equation in the world in terms of the ecological balance. The second one is to do with social inclusion. And what is happening now is that a third of the world's population is living in slums in cities. The urgency is to deal with that problem today. So to try and design cities, uh, provide them with the infrastructure that is necessary to make people live in a civilized way. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, a city, the capital of Colombia, Bogota, not a small place, seven million people with enormous problems over the years because of drug violence and everything else, has invested in um, cycle lanes, has in addressed, uh, invested in a uh, bus rapid transit system, which I know you have uh, here in Cape Town, and I saw one, uh, the same system in Johannesburg the other day. But much more significantly than um, just investing in good public transport, rather than um, privileging the car, uh, they've invested in schools, in libraries and public spaces, right at the heart of the informal settlements. So as I travel the world, the projects that I see which are the most interesting at this micro scale are the ones to do with the ingenuity of the designer. For example, uh, the Chilean architect Alejandro Aravena, who has invented a new system of housing called Elemental, which is just a very simple structure which can adapt to change and therefore deals with informality and the sort of unorganized growth that you get in most of the sort of squatter settlements around the world. And it's as relevant here in Cape Town or Alexandra, Soweto and Joburg or, or as it is in the um, favelas of Brazil. I think there's a massive amount that you can do. You know, create a tree, a few benches and, and some decent paving where normally there's sewer, open sewers and, and, um, and mud. In the book there's a beautiful sentence by um, Suketu Mehta in an essay about India and Indian cities where the most deprived who come into Mumbai talk about Mumbai as a bird of gold which if you come in do whatever you need to do, get a job, you can then fly. And I think that metaphor is exactly how I see cities. They have that potential. You can either get it right or get it wrong.